You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Just a few notes before we get started with the episode this week. Please continue to support our affiliate promotion with Amazon. If you shop at Amazon, I know you do, use the link on our website. You can find it at the bottom of every page on our site. And the way this works is we make a percentage of what you spend at Amazon, and it doesn't cost you a thing. You can do your normal Amazon shopping, and we'll make a percentage of what you spend. We'll take what we earn, and just like the rest of our affiliate sponsors, we'll put it back into the veteran community. It's that simple. It's that easy. It doesn't cost you a dime, and it's the best way for you to help out with veterans in your community and around the world just by going to Amazon through our website, hazardground.com. I want to remind you guys to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground, at Hazard Ground Podcast as well. Make sure you leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. These things are so big for us. But, you know, what's great about the ratings and the reviews that we get is sometimes we get some reviews that are just outstanding. And I want to read you one this week from a listener. He says, as a civilian, there's certainly a lot I do not know about the military and warfare. But I do know that our military has and deserves my deepest appreciation. This podcast helps me learn about and appreciate those who have served, and it is an inspiration to me. I've also been made aware of some awesome organizations that are doing good work on behalf of our vets and are worthy of my support. Thanks for putting on this show. It's those kind of comments that really hit home for us. It's so important that we hear that feedback from you, but more importantly, that we're making a difference and you guys are making a difference too. So please keep the ratings and the reviews coming on iTunes. It helps us out so, so much. And we certainly appreciate you guys being part of the Hazard Ground community. Now onto this week's show. Joining us this week is another veteran of the United States Army who served in the Gulf War. He's a retired Chief Warrant Officer 4 who is also a Green Beret. And his story is one that you haven't heard, but you need to. It resembles a story that you're familiar with from the War on Terror, Lone Survivor where he and his comrades were trapped behind enemy lines. He spent a total of 24 years serving in the United States Army. He is Chad Baldwin joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Chad, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. All right, 24 years. How much of that was spent as a Green Beret? 20, 21 plus years. Okay, so how did you get into the military? Did you sign up for a Green Beret contract? I I did. Initially, initially I was in the military from 1971 through 1972, where, where I volunteered for the draft, and I did a two-year stint in the 82nd Airborne Division. And I came back home to, to my home near West Virginia, Wheeling, West Virginia, where I worked in coal mines, mills, a variety of different jobs, but was unable to find the camaraderie that I experienced, and I re-entered the military in 1978. And at that time, I enlisted and signed up for special forces training. Now, wait a second. So you enlisted to avoid the draft during the tail end of Vietnam. Did you That's think, did you think at that time you were actually going to go see Vietnam? Was that sort of the intent? Cause we talked to a lot of Vietnam vets who say, well, I signed up to avoid the draft because I felt like I had a little bit more control. Was that your thought process? It, what was my thought process at that time? We're talking about the early 1970s and the sixties when Vietnam was raging the area I grew up in, it was just common. It was known that when you got out of high school as a, as a male, that you was going to go do time in the military. At that time, they, they switched around the draft till they went with a lottery where they chose your birthday. So in order to get by that, I went in and I told them I wanted to volunteer for the draft, which was a two-year enlistment. And it, my, my intent at that time was to go on ahead after high school and get my, my military service done because that was a way of life in the area I was brought up in. Most everyone I knew after high school, they went and did military service. So it was kind of tradition and custom for those of us living in, in Appalachia to do that. So you do the two years, you avoid Vietnam. And yet you still go back in six years later. What was the change in the motivation? It it wasn't my intent to to avoid Vietnam. Uh, That wasn't the intent. No, no, I didn't mean it that way. I just meant I I meant you were like fortunate enough not to have to go to Vietnam. I mean, look, a lot of people went to Vietnam, didn't come back. So uh, I I wasn't assuming that you were trying to avoid going to Vietnam. But fortunately, you didn't have to deploy there. 
and yet you get out and then decide to go back in. So why? Yes, that's that's true. And and Vietnam at that time in in 1971, January 71, when I entered, it was on the drawdown. Right. And when I went to, went to the 82nd, the 82nd Airborne Division at that time had just redeployed from Vietnam and was coming back. So all oh, most everyone I served with it at that time, they were all you know Vietnam veterans. But Vietnam was drawing down. And they they was not sending many more you know uh, people into Vietnam. They, rather, they were drawing down at that time. All right. So when 1978 rolls back around, why are you back sitting in front of a recruiter again? Because of, of I, I had a good experience in the military. I liked the discipline. I liked the camaraderie. And when I came back home, what was available to me then as a high school graduate was coal mines or steel mills or other jobs like that. I did that. I went into a coal mine and I found out that I did not like working underground. It was bothersome to me. I, I did I did a lot of other different jobs uh, b- between 1972 and 1978 when I went back in. And toward the end of it, I found I was unable to find something that I really enjoyed doing. I was unable to find the the life that I was looking for. Really the story behind that is I prayed about it one day and I opened the Bible and I closed my eyes and I pointed to a verse because I was asking for guidance. And the verse said, for he was a man of war. To me, it was clear that that was the intent and that's what I was to do. And I went and enlisted in the military. When did you first hear the term Green Beret and what made you want to be one? I had heard the term uh, during the Vietnam War about Green Berets. I, I personally at that time, I did not know any Green Berets. But as I went back in as a prior service uh, member, when I went to, to the uh, recruiting station, one of the jobs that was available for prior service people at that time was a special forces medical sergeant. So I enlisted uh, to be a special forces medic at that time. Okay. Um, did you have any medical background at all? I mean, is it just... I, I did not. I was going on faith alone and, you know, in, in, in trust. Did you have any idea how hard it was to be a Green Beret when you signed up? I, I did not. I had no <laughs> idea. I, I, I went in and I, again, I, because I had such a lapse in service through the, those six years, I had to re-go through basic combat training. Oh, you did? I was just going to ask yeah. you that. Yeah, it was, it was like starting all over again. I went through basic combat training. Then I went to my advanced individual training as a combat medic at, uh, at Fort Sam Houston and then reported to Fort Bragg for special forces training. So when you get to Fort Bragg, what are you thinking? I'm, I'm prepared. I'd heard, you know, that it was a physically challenging course. Uh, and, and I was prepared for that aspect of it. You know, it, it went through that where I met a lot of good comrades and a lot of lifelong friends at this time that we went through the course together, we supported each other, and it was a very physically demanding course. The aspect that I was not uh, aware of was how mentally challenging it was and how much you know how, how much you had to delve this, particularly as being a Special Forces medic. It was a very in-depth and it was a very, uh, a very thorough course in, in military medicine, uh, trauma care, childhood medicine, veterinary care, dental care, it, it was basically a general uh, medical practitioner, as well as getting down to minor surgery on on your limbs. Yeah, it's funny you bring up the minor surgery thing because we've recounted special forces medics are the only people who are not doctors but are still authorized to perform surgery on the battlefield. Correct? Uh, that 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 is true. And, and when we talk about surgery, we're not talking about going into the chest cavity or into things like that. We're talking about about wounds to the exterior you know, uh, in a lot of emergency medicine. Do they still do, I, I, ta- I knew a couple of Special Forces medics, do they still do the euthanization thing? Uh, like they'll take a goat who's going to be euthanized and they'll shoot it, you have to stop the bleeding, then they'll break its leg and you have to splint it and then they'll, you know, inject something to make its heart rate go fast. Like, you know, just continue to keep this thing alive for, you know, 18, 24 hours until you can get it to proper care, right? You, 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 heard, you heard correct. Yes. Yeah. That, that, is really, that was really the final, they, they called it goat lab at that time. And that, that was the final phase for being a special forces medic you had to go through. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, I remember it well, yes. We've assigned a goat as a patient. Mm-hmm. 
and you, you had to do a complete medical write-up on that goat. You had to do stool samples, urinalysis, blood work, everything on your goat, and you had to, you know, treat the goat. And then at one point, you was broken down into surgical teams. So when you go into the surgical ward, which it was as clean as any U.S. hospital that would operate on patients, you had to gown up, you had to scrub up. The surgical room was completely clean. And you would go in, and as your rotation, when it was your goat's turn, they would they would put the goat under anesthesia. It would be put in a chamber. They would fire a high-powered round through the leg, the semimembanosus, tendinosus muscle group, and then they would bring it into the surgical ward, where you would scrub up and you would do a uh, you would do surgery, delayed primary closure. You'd stop the wound. You'd debreed the wound. Uh, then you would do a delayed primary closure, and you would nurse that goat back to health after it had to round through, it, through its rear leg. That is unreal. I mean, that's just – talk about a high-tense, high-pressure situation. I mean, if the goat dies, you fail, right? Like, is it that simple? <laughs> not, not necessarily fail. Okay. You would have to go in front of a – they called it the murder board. <laughs> you would go in front Pun of intended, a I guess, right? <laughs> Yes, and you'd have to explain what happened and why that, why that went down. So really having your go die, die was, was really a bad thing. And then the part you were talking about is really at the, at the end of the course where they would take the goats, and of course they were completely under anesthesia at that time, and they would, do, they would do a lot of trauma to it. And then you would be called to come down and do a primary and a secondary survey to discover what was wrong with the goat. You had to treat it. Uh, immediate life-saving techniques, stopping the bleeding, uh, you know, making sure the heart's beating, make sure the airway's clear, and then on to secondary. And then it, after you stabilized the goat, you'd have to transport it, They'd basically load it up on a litter and carry it into a field, uh, a field medical hospital, where you would also have to do some advanced uh, treatment, starting starting the IVs, uh, you know, and, and bringing the goat back around to where it was it was coherent. Before finally, at the end, the goat would go on ahead, and they would they would dispose of it and put, and put it under. That's incredible. Um, when you look back on that whole experience, are you kind of overwhelmed at how you got through it all? I, I am. As I look back, it was a very it was a very demanding course. Uh, mentally, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of homework, a lot of assignments, uh, basically relearning an entire you know a, a new vocabulary and medical terminology. You know your childhood diseases, the entire uh, body systems. Uh, so it, it was a very intense course, and when you came out of it, you you were very well qualified to be a special forces medic. And then, and as a special forces medic, after coming out of that course, I found out that that the special forces medic also you do house calls for your team members and your teammates if their wife or their children was ill. You would go over, you know, you was expected to do that, and I, I enjoyed doing that. You'd go to the house, you'd meet the families, you know, you would treat the kids, you would you would have uh, uh, medicines, and then if, you know, if it was something that required, you know, some other care, then you would recommend that they take them into the, you know, into the, into the medical clinic or into the hospital. Crazy. When you get that, that special forces tab and they hand you a green beret. I mean, are you sitting here thinking this is a long way from Wheeling, West Virginia in the coal mines? It, it absolutely was. And you know, there, there, there was a lot of, there's a lot of focus on, on, on the headwear, the green beret. And in essence, it's, it's really not about, about the beret. It's about the person and the development, the education, the teamwork that's required to be able to be a part of a very intimate a, a very highly professional team that is is fully combat capable. Okay, so when do you finish special forces training? Like year, month frame? I I, I finished up in in uh, actually it was December of 1979, and in January of 1980, I reported to the Fifth Special Forces Group for assignment to my first uh, operation team. Now, other than limited skirmishes. Uh, Panama, Grenada, um, you know, there's not, the, I mean, the next 10 years are relative peacetime, correct? That, that's absolutely correct. It was, it, was, it was peacetime where we constantly deployed, but we had, we, we would deploy overseas as part of mobile training teams. We did, a, initially we did a lot of, of work in Greece, working with the Hellenic Raiding Force. We had deployed over there. 
and and that went on until 1986 when the they stood up the United States Special Operations Command, and Special Force officially became, a, a, you know, its own branch of the military. So in that time, when do you become a warrant officer, or is this not until after Desert Storm? No, it was it was prior to Desert Storm. Okay. I, went, I went to, to ni- 1985. I went into the warrant officer training program. What made you do that? I had in 1984 they they came out with the very first special forces warrant officer class. On the special forces A team, which consisted of 12 people, there was a captain as a detachment commander, and there was a lieutenant assigned, that's supposed to be the assistant detachment commander. It was a position never filled because you had to be a branch qualified captain mm-hmm. to come to special forces. Sure, yeah. So, so they stood up and they said, well, what we're going to do is create a special forces warrant officer that will develop and groom to fill that role as an assistant detachment commander. And so in 1985, in the second year group, I went through the, the, the training to become a special forces warrant officer. Now, interesting, because at that point in time, clearly they were training for something that they didn't know what the full capacity or full use was. It was going to like, they knew the intent of what they wanted. As you just stated, they sort of wanted a backup commander, an XO, whatever it may be. Uh, But to that end, clearly uh, as you go forward, you realize that role takes on a different form and a different life. So throughout your time, after you became a warrant, did you begin to realize that your job description was much different than what you had trained to be? It, it, it was it, from a medic. Yes, it was. It was different. But as a special forces soldier, it, you know, I I was accustomed to that. I had been on the A team. I had had numerous deployments. Had worked with uh, with teammates and all the specialties on the team. And uh, as I said, in 1984, there was a few warrant officers that came back to the company I was in, Charlie Company, the first battalion of the Fifth Special Forces Group that I knew very well, and they motivated me and actually acted as mentors. And my talking to them and finding out what they were doing is what led me to want to go to be a warrant officer. Now, when you became a warrant, your job didn't change as a Green Beret, did it? You were still the team medic? No, I was not the team medic any longer. We had okay. team medics assigned. I, I, basically, I, you're, you serve as a, a special operations technician, and it, it, you're... you're Realm of knowledge had to expand. You were you had to be functional in operations and intelligence. You had to hold uh, three of the five military specialties to be on the special forces team. Uh, I, I was a, a, a medic. I was a weapons uh, guy, and I was also an intel sergeant. So I had those three of the five career fields I already possessed. You had to have you had to be language uh, qualified or highly certified in the defense language aptitude test. That was another that was another gate to pass. And then you had to be recommended to your chain of command to go to the course. A lot of training. Um, and, and, you know, obviously it, uh, it all is necessary and all pays off. All right, so let's fast forward to uh, beginning of August 1990, because uh, that's when Saddam Hussein chooses to invade Kuwait. Where are you stationed? What are you doing? What's going on? Do you remember that event actually happening? Oh, I, I remember it very well because what was going on at the time, my team, uh, at that time, I was the, a, a, an assistant detachment commander, but my team had been assigned to go to language school to learn Spanish language because up to that time, all the activity and everything going on in Special Forces was in South and Central America where the 7th Special Forces Group was fully engaged in Honduras and El Salvador and other South American countries. Right. So the intent was to train up qualified Special Forces people from the 5th Group, give them a language, and send them to South America to augment and, and work with the 7th Special Forces Group. So we, we had approximately it was a company-sized element that was in this language school made up of various teams from throughout the 5th Group. And it was it was a those language schools and local language schools. I I tell people that it's like getting fed with a fire hose. You know, you'll go home that night and it's like here's the hundred words you have to know today. Well, the next day you may remember three or four of them. So it you know <laughs> it's it's a constant <laughs> learning to thing. And about about four months into the course, 
he was in the classroom, and the battalion executive officer came in and told everybody, pick up your books and come with me. Little do we know, that was the end of that course, because we was deploying to Operation Desert Storm. Are you thinking, that, like, wow, this is awesome at this point, or... I, you know, I was, it, it was kind of, you know, we, we, we knew about uh, Saddam, you know, going into Kuwait and the things that was going on, but it was, it was kind of a surprise because we was totally focused there on learning the Spanish language, my, me and my teammates, and then potentially being deployed in the South and Central America. So when we got the call, Hey, we're deploying, it was, it was just a rapid, uh, outloading of our gear. Of course, we always maintained a high state of readiness. We had our equipment ready. We had everything ready to, to load out. And, and it was the it was the first full deployment of the entire 5th Special Forces Group since the Vietnam War. And it was a massive undertaking. I don't think people realize what a mass a movement of personnel and cargo and equipment. You know, basically they moved a, a large portion of the U.S. military into Saudi Arabia in a short period of time. All right, so you are heading over to um, in, over to the Middle East in support of Operation Desert Shield. When you yes. get there, what month, you know, year is it? What do you know? What's your mission? What are you supposed to be doing? So on and so forth. This was this was a this was probably in um, late nineteen. 19- 90, you know, it was around November, December when we got up and, and then deployed into Operation Desert Storm. And then, so we was there for, well, it was basically, I'm, I'm sorry, it was, it, was, it was probably late in August. And then we got there, and we saw so I was there September, and, you know, October, November, and, and et cetera. And then we was, my team, when we first went there, the entire group was basically spread out by the battalions. We was in the basement of a international airport in, the, in Saudi Arabia. Um, I think it was called Riyadh. And there was a, mm-hmm. uh, a huge complex that was being built. It was the King Fahd International Airport. And we was basically staying down into the full basement of this massive structure that was still under construction. So as that's going on, we're down in, in basically in, in the lower level of these things, you know, preparing for what would come, the missions that would, would come down. But they took a while for those missions to, to come down. And at that time, the, I was assigned to a military freefall team that I had been on for, for, for several years. Um, and so that team, we actually deployed up to the, the – uh, the border of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, where we was doing border surveillance, we was directly on the border, being forward observers and reporting, because you could actually look across the border and see the the Iraqi forces that as they, they were built up and aligned on the on the on the other side of the border in in Kuwait. And then um, it was later on when uh, then that there was a team. That was down there. We called that area the Bat Cave. That was down in the bowels of the uh, of the international airport. So we had one team out of the entire group, the, the Special Forces group, a very highly qualified team, whose officer had just left. He was going to go to try out for the Counter Terrorism Force of Delta, mm-hmm. and then their team sergeant, the Master Sergeant, got moved up to be the company sergeant major. So you had a, a team, a fully qualified team. That basically lost their leadership, but they did have a, they did have some senior NCOs, and one of those NCOs was elevated to the team sergeant. But because there was no officer assigned, they were they were basically non deployable, and they were back in the, in the rear, basically you know doing work for the battalion. And when the battalion commander came up to the border and asked me if I would come back and take command of ODA five two. 525, which was the, 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 the scuba team in the uh, uh, Bravo company at that time of the 1st Battalion, which I did. And when I got back, I, when the battalion commander asked me that, I told him, sir, if I'm going to have any credibility as, as a commander of that team, then we're going to need to uh, be among the first missions that come down, the combat missions that come down, that, that you know, I want my team to be involved in that. And he agreed to that, and, and for that reason, then we was we 
later was assigned to a special reconnaissance mission that was going deep into Iraq on the eve of the ground war. Okay. So you are stationed right now on the border of Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Um, and just to orient uh, everybody. Kuwait, yes. Well, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, well, all three of them sort of border of each other. I'm just trying to get an yeah. idea of, of where you are. But, you know, again, Kuwait shares a border with Iraq and Saudi Arabia. So they're all there. All right. Yes. So you're on ground there. How many missions are you doing prior to Desert Shield becoming Desert Storm? Like, and for those who don't remember history, Desert Shield, we were there sort of in a preparatory phase. Desert Storm is when the United States started movement across the border into Kuwait and into Iraq to actually begin fighting. So did you notice a difference? Was there a difference for you? We knew we was involved when I was on the border doing border surveillance. We did 24-7 operations where actually we, we would patrol along that border, you know, day and night. So we our team was broken down. We had shifts that were 12 hour shifts that we'd work would be on 12 hours, off 12 hours. So it was a continual rotation of basically surveillance across the, the border, providing an early tripwire had the, had the uh, Iraqis decided to come over into Saudi Arabia. So we was we was completely involved at that time, but there was no combat uh, operations going on at the time. Okay. When do combat operations kick off from your point of view? Like when when do you understand that they're starting? Well, it was it was in it was in January, I believe it was seventeenth of January. Right, nineteen ninety one, right? Yes, when the air war kicked off. Right. At that time I had I had already came back uh it was probably late November, early December when I left the border and came back to assume command of ODA five two five. Okay. So do you after that, you end up back in the Middle East, though, correct? No, no we was uh, when I say back, I, w- I came back down to King Fahd International Airport. Okay, Arabia, I'm sorry. Okay, Saudi Arabia. Right. Okay. So you take. And I just want to make sure everybody is following along here um, for yes. for clarity's sake. So mm-hmm. I wasn't sure if when you said you left, you went back and then and then came yeah, back. I, but, I, I went back back to the back sure. to the rear, basically, and in, down into Saudi Arabia from the front line area. Okay. Um, and, and this is kind of where, and I don't want to skip over too much because, um, you know, what happened to you in your particular situation for your team, uh, is the crux of your story on February 24th, 1991, but between the beginning of the air invasion on January 17th, 91, and up through the next month, is anything going on for you? There's, there's a lot going on. We, we understood that we was going to have to do a, a, a special reconnaissance mission, uh, we was in the process because we was going to live in what we know is a hide site. Basically, it's a hole dug into the ground that is completely camouflaged and completely covered where you go and camp and, and you live in that, that confined. Basically, it was, uh, I think it was an eight foot by eight foot, eight foot by nine foot hole, about four foot deep, had a dome type cover. So we, we was rehearsing. We was gathering intel, and we was preparing for this mission because we would actually go out in Saudi Arabia. We rehearsed digging the hide sites, finding how much it was going to take. We had to develop our own what we called a hide site kit because there was no standard kit for hide sites. We knew the hide sites were used by the British in the Falkland Wars. We knew that it was an effective mean for a team to go in and pull surveillance and basically be out of, of sight. And, and that's what we were rehearsing for was building that hide site. We was actually out, had just dug a hide site, moved into it, figuring out, you know, arrangements, how he's going to live in there. You're going to live, you're going to eat, you're going to go to the bathroom, uh, you know, all in a close uh, confines with with three others. So there was four people. We had two separate hide sites. I had an eight-man team. There was four of us that was planning on going into two hide sites. So when the ground, the, the air war kicked off, we was actually out in our hindsight. We had our radio turned on, and we could hear the transmissions going on, and we knew that the air war had kicked off. So the hindsight was technically in Iraq, correct? It, the hindsight we were going to build was, was in Iraq, but we okay. was rehearsing back in the confines of sure. Saudi Arabia. All right. So technically, at least as history details it, you know, the ground war only lasts four days. From the 24th of February to the 28th of February, and then it was a very quick surrender. Um, But it is February 24th, 1991, where you get probably the scariest moment of your life in your career. 
uh, as you talk about this hindsight. So give me just, you know, the background before that. What are you told prior to the 24th? Um, are you clear on the mission? Do you understand what you're supposed to be doing? And, and give me the kind of the information on all that. Yes, we, we was clear on what we was doing. Basically, there was a major highway that came out of Baghdad to An Nasiriyah and headed, headed south down into Saudi Arabia. We knew that that was a major avenue approach for Iraqi forces. The commander of the 18th Airborne Corps, you got to remember at this time there was no drones and we didn't have the, 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 the equipment that we have today sure, to yeah. do that type of work. So our, our mission was to go in on the eve of the ground war before the ground war started, get into our high site and report on activity along this major avenue of approach known as Highway 7. So we had to report signature items of equipment. Certain equipment is, is it, it points out what unit is moving along the road because there are certain units that have certain types of equipment. And the, the commander of the 18th Airborne Corps, that as we as we knew later, he was planning on doing basically a big hinge that was going to come up around and encapsulate and encircle the Iraqi forces, you know, between the, the land and the sea and destroy them. But he wanted to know what the Iraqis were doing when the ground floor launched. He wanted to know if they were coming down, if they were reinforcing, if they were withdrawing. It was important to him to guard that, that far left flank of his operations. And that's the reason that we were put out into the desert, basically 150 miles inside of Iraq before the, the ground wars started. And, and let me provide just some historical perspective that, you know, non-military folks who uh, trying to understand the nature of this whole thing. Um, and this is all detailed in a book called Kill Bin Laden by Dalton Fury, who is a Delta Force commander. But one of the things that happened when the kickoff of the... Um, you know, war on terror in Afghanistan, uh, special forces teams like you, like what you were a part of, those guys would be working in two man teams. And literally they in, in two man and three man elements were climbing to the top of mountains in Afghanistan, radioing their position and radioing targets for, and they were literally up there for days at a time, three and four days at a time without relief, just what clothes they yeah. can put on their backs, what food they can carry in their packs. And their job was to stay concealed and do nothing but make radio calls. And oh, by the way, this is, you know, October, November in Afghanistan in the mountains when it's, you know, 40 below and freezing. Um, yeah. But this is the same sort of thing where you are providing eyes on the ground for air targets coming in, correct? Or in this case, you were providing eyes yeah. on the ground yeah. for, you know, tanks in what would be at the time it was the 1st Cavalry Division, 1st Armored Division, 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment, 24th ID, 100 for all that stuff. Um, but that's what you were doing the whole time, correct? That that is correct, and we had a special emphasis on on Scud missiles because that was a big problem. So you know, if, if we had spot Scud missiles, those were to be immediately reported and identified. All right. So you kick off on the twenty fourth. You get to your hide site. Any problems getting to the hide site itself? Yes, we had we had lots of problems getting in it. And basically, this was the, the eve of the ground war, which right. which was the, the day prior. So it was on the twenty third. Okay. Of, of February, we had prepared. We had already coordinated with the, the Special Operations Aviation Regiment, the Night Stalkers, mm -hmm. who was doing the, the insert, inserts at that time, our infiltrations. Uh, we had planned out our route. We had, we had gathered intel. We knew that the, the area we was going into. We knew the spot that we wanted to go to. Uh, so what was, was left then was carrying out the mission. And we had done a, a lot of preparation, a lot of intel gathering, uh, you know, we went. We go through a period of planning that we call isolation, and that's exactly what it is. Your team is isolated; they're basically locked up, and their sole job is to is to plan for the mission. Once you're done with that mission planning, the mission preparation, the the team would go and they do what's called a brief back to the battalion and commander and his staff. That lets them know that this team has done their homework, they're fully prepared, and they're ready for the mission. So we did that. We did our brief back. We got our okay. We was, you know, we was good to go on our mission to do a special reconnaissance inside of Iraq. At that point, we wasn't sure exactly when we was going to do this mission. As a matter of fact, after we finished our isolation and our brief back, they had a brief incursion, the Iraqi forces did, into Saudi Arabia, into the port city of Kafchi. And, and that... Um, 
that the entire city got emptied out. It was basically an abandoned city. And so the team, as we was preparing, you know, for the ground war to kick off, we was sent into the, the port city of Kofji, which is on the, the Kuwaiti Saudi Arabia border. There, they felt there was a forward observer hiding somewhere in the city, calling uh, artillery strikes on American forces and allied forces. As you know, there was a huge contingent of, of allied forces, Arab forces that was along alongside of us. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, so we, we had to go in, and basically we was searching the city for forward observers and signs of anybody that would be in that city. We was in the, the midst of that mission. It had been up there several days when we got recalled, and we knew it was time for us to go do our primary mission going into Iraq. So we got called, recalled back from Kofji, back down to the Bat Cave, if you will, down in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and then prepared to uh, it infiltrate into our mission. We had prepared our hindsight kits. There was no standard kit. The, air, the airport that was being built, as it was under construction, special forces are renowned scroungers. <laughs> we had one of our, our sergeants go out, and he had found conduit, basically electrical conduit, that he brought back, and so we cut that conduit. We had a larger piece and a smaller piece, so that it would you could put the smaller piece inside the, the the larger piece, and it would expand out. And we got several of these in our hindsight kit. We developed it on the the concept of an umbrella. There would be a, a a center pole that would come up inside the hindsight. It would these rods then would be coming out off the center pole. And coming out like an umbrella, it would be covered with plastic. It'd be covered with with some uh, burlap, and then then you could put earth and, and soil over top of it. You could put vegetation on it. You would have a small um, a small viewing port in front of it where you could view the hideway, and and that hide site kit then that became what we was going to go in and build our hide. That's what we had rehearsed with. So we had exceptionally heavy rucksacks. Special forces lose on their feet. They infiltrate generally by helicopter, by airborne operations, by seaborne operations, and and uh, you know everything that we have is carried on our back, including that hide side kit, including five gallons of water per man. Five gallons is another forty pounds. Our rucksacks weighed one hundred and seventy-five pounds wow. per man when we got on the helicopter and when we infiltrated into Iraq. Now, we went up to get, when we got ready to infiltrate, we linked up with the helicopter crews. At, at this time, we was further north, and we went into a small airfield. It was along the border um, where we got ready, and we got onto two Black Hawk helicopters. We had four men on each helicopter. Uh, we was ready to go. The, the aircraft crew, they knew the routes. We got into the helicopter. I was the only person as a commander. I was on a headset with the lead pilot of the lead aircraft. So we took off out of the, the small air base that was up along the border and went across the border into Iraq. And we had only been gone for 10, 15 minutes when for some reason the pilot said, hey, we've been recalled. So we turn, had to turn around and, of course, our emotions were running high, and we thought, what's going on? The time we got back to the small airfield, it ended up being, it was just a messed up thing where they called for a recall, but it, they said, oh, that didn't mean you guys. <laughs> oh, God. So, so that kind of, that was kind of the start to this mission. It was, you know, it kind of, things got off to a bad start. So in order to relaunch again, because they burned fuel, they had to refuel the helicopters. What this did was put us behind our time frame for the time we wanted to get on the ground to give us time to dig and build our hindsight before first light. So we relaunched again. As we're going in into uh, Iraq, coming across enemy defensive positions, flying low to the ground, their, their radar is lighting up or they're getting painted by, by air defense units. Um, so they tried to fly. They it was trying to fly very low. They was just off the deck. At one point, there there was two instances on the way in that that was kind of indicators of what was to come. At one point, they were flying low and fast, and the helicopter actually bumped on the top of a sand dune, and it it broke the shock absorber off of the rear wheel on the Black Hawk helicopter. Oh wow! 
So the, the helicopter was not going to be able to land and fully put down, but the heli- the pilot was, he was, that's okay. We can land. We can just put the, the front two wheels on the ground. I can hover a little bit. You guys can get out and we'll go on. Fine, let's go. Uh, so we continued on. I mean, that kind of, that was a, a, lo- a jolt that hit everybody. And I was on the headset immediately, you know, hey, what's going on? And to their credit, the task force pilots were very calm. They said, oh, no big deal. We just hit a sand dune. <laughs> so, well, okay. Well, if they're not excited about it, then, then I shouldn't be. At another point, we were flying across a marshy area, which the, the helicopter crew was not prepared for. That wasn't part of the route. So the, the intel at that time was not as robust as we would have today. Going across the marsh, that, that marsh, a, a flock, I believe it was ducks or geese, flew up, and one of them got sucked into the engine on the Black Hawk helicopter. They had to immediately shut the fuel off to that that engine, but they continued on that mission, flying on one engine, and you know, to go on into the spot that we was designated. We was we was located halfway between An Nasiriya and Baghdad, approximately 150 miles deep into Iraqi territory. There was no friendly support. We had no artillery fire. There was no no friendly forces in the unit in the area. Basically, we were on our own once we rolled off the Black Hawk helicopters. The um, and then the other thing that happened before we got, got there, at that time they had the, the global positioning systems, the GPS that they flew by, but those were dependent on the number of satellites that were in the sky at a given time. Mm-hmm. Well, because of the delay, the satellite coverage fell off, and they had to they had to travel on what they called the RAN system. It was a backup navigational system, and the the the, uh, the pilots informed me that they was going to be unable to put me on that exact spot that we picked out. My response was, "You get us as close as you possibly can," and we continued on, you know, on with our mission on the, another uh, another navigational system. This is a lot going wrong before you actually get down on the ground, right? (laughs) Yes. This is all going on while in flight. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, keep going. So, you know, I guess it was an indication. So prior to coming in, the the helicopters would fly very low, and then they would do what we called false insertions. They would rise up in the air to where they could get painted by radar and stuff, and then they they would drop down. They would set close to the ground, you know, for 10 or 15 seconds and then lift back off and fly very low and move away from that area. So they did two false insertions, and the intent was that if we're being tracked, that they're going to go to these other locations and not to the actual area where we're getting off. Right. Finally, we we got into the area we was going to. We sat down. The teams rolled out four man per on each helicopter rolled out onto the into the to the floor of the the desert and the plains, if you will at that time uh, the helicopters took off and flew out, and we could just hear you know the sounds of the helicopter moving away. We initially moved off of that landing zone out of the area where we set up, and we took approximately ten to fifteen minutes to do nothing but sit there and take in the sights and the sound and let our vision get adjusted to the evening before we before we moved out. As the helicopters were flying away, we heard a lot of dogs barking. Intel told us we didn't have to worry about dogs. They said that, that the Arabs don't like dogs and they don't have dogs. Well, that, that turned out to not be true. That <laughs> the Bedouins and the people that live out in, you know, in the country, uh, they do have dogs and they use them you know, as, as herd animals and watch animals just, just like we do. But as the helicopter got out of sight, because we thought that the dogs were barking because of our presence, but they were barking because of the sound of the helicopter, because it, as it flew out, then the, the barking ceased. Uh, as we then looked up, we, we uh, determined the best we could to where we was on the ground. And then by that time, we had had satellites for backup, so we had a, a, a GPS system. And at that time, a GPS system was probably the size of an old metal lunchbox. Mm-hmm. You know, now they're down to a handheld device. But yeah, you get them on a watch device. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on a, on a watch. But, you know, and you had to first set it out there. You had to bring up the satellites. You had to track. And, and the more satellites you could track, the more pinpoint your location would be. So we was able to determine where we was at and where we had to go. And we we was probably about a mile off 
of our initial site that we wanted to come into. It's not a mile's not a, a long way, but it's a long way when you're carrying 175 pounds on your back. Mm-hmm. So we so we moved out. Uh, we we set our point men out. We moved out across the area to identify and find where we're going to put the hide sites. Of course, by this time it's getting very late into the evening. We planned on you know landing just after dark, you know, which at that time was around at eight thirty to nine o'clock. And and here we're you know we're getting on midnight. So we move up to an area. We finally we finally set up a little security camp and myself. And my uh, weapon sergeant, who was also my point man, we moved out away from the rest of the, the guys to go find and pinpoint the location to put in the hide sites. While we was doing that, we had an emergency radio system that we took and we put into what we call cache. Basically, we bury it and you hide it at a point in the ground. And our intent with doing that was preparing if we had problems and we had to run and we had to get away that if everything else was gone, we could move to this site and we could recover this cache that had emergency radio in it and had some other, you know, had some other supplies in it that we would need. So our, we had very thorough planning. So as, as we're going out to find the hide sites, two of the other guys move out to put in this cache. It took us longer than we anticipated to pinpoint and find the area to put in the hide sites. Basically, the area was... It was kind of like an agricultural field, not necessarily level field, but there was a there was a lot of irrigation canals that had been hand dug, where the dirt was thrown up onto the edge of the canals, and those canals came. So it was you know we had to go down in the canals to cross them, and and finally it was so late that we decided we got to an area, that we went to one of these canals, and we started to dig our hindsight, and then we found out that. The intel was incorrect about another thing. They told us that the soil composition up there in Iraq was real similar to what it is in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, it was sandy, loam type of soil. It was easy to dig. We had de-handled shovels. You could dig that soil easily. When we got into Iraq, the the soil was was very hard. It was like you know, it was like a a, a field or a pasture you think of in, in, here in the states. We was unable. We did not have mattocks or tools, so we decided that after we found out that the soil consistency was different, we was going to dig into these mounds. This was dirt that had already been dug, so it was softer and easier to dig into. We were going to dig into one of these mounds to put in the high site, and that ended up being a very laborious task. So we ended up, we, we put in basically an expeditionary type of hide site where we used the canal itself. We filled sandbags and we blocked off the front end and we used the canal as the cover area and we put up our hide site. Thinking no problem, we're out in a, you know, we're out in an agricultural type of fields. Our mindset was here in the States, you know, a farmer may go out into his field, you know, when they plant or when they harvest, but they're not out there on a daily basis, you know, moving around the fields. So we set up our hide site. We finally got the caps put on, and we was in the hide sites by first light, contacted the 18th Airborne Corps that we was in place and ready to start our mission, which we did. But as the first light came up, we realized that the intel that we had got, we had satellite uh, photos of the area. We later found out that them satellite photos were probably 10 years old or older, but they had been stamped with the date that we received them. So we thought that it was up to date and we thought this image was correct. You know, there was a lot more activity in the area. There was a village across Highway 7 and we was on, if the Highway 7 ran from from the south to the north, and we was on the west side of Highway 7, probably a thousand meters, well, not at that time, we was about 300 meters back off the highway where we'd be close enough where we could identify the signature right of equipment coming up and down the highway so we could report that. We had talked about if, you know, the, the, if we came up on civilians, and we asked that question, what would civilians in that area, what would be their reaction if we came up on them? The response was, well, they could be hostile, they may be friendly or they could be indifferent. I thought, well, that's, you know, that's an answer that covers everything. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, there was, there was not a good foundation on the intel in that area. A lot of people moving around. And 
as we got in, I had two of two of my guys. It was Sergeant, uh, Staff Sergeant Weatherford and uh, and Sergeant First Class uh, Danny Kostrepsky. He was the medic. They were watching the portal of the high site. The other two of us, myself and Staff Sergeant DeGroff, we were kind of resting and we were setting up and trying to, you know, preparing the hide sites. And it may sound like something, you know, that you have to plan for, but what if you have to pee? What if you, you know, you have to go to the bathroom where you, you know, we had plastic bags and we had uh, surgeon gloves that the medic carried. So if we, we, we had to pee, we would pee in one of these gloves, we would tie it up, and then we would dig holes back into the, the side of our hindsight where we'd bury it. The same thing if you had to defecate. You would right. do that and it would be buried. But come first light... That was all, <laughs> that wasn't what was our mind. It was a lot of the movement that we seen. A lot of people were coming out into the fields. A, a lot of, there was men, there was women were walking around gathering wood. And so as it being, we had children. There was, there was three kids. There was uh, the two girls and a small boy. And they were probably seven, eight, nine years old. The little boy was probably four or five. They happened to come up on the area, and they recognized that something was different about the area. We didn't think that people came into that area that they wouldn't recognize if there was a small change, you know, uh, to to the soil and if there was something different. These kids came up, and they actually looked into the portal of the hide site. And, uh, you know, they looked in, and here they seen camouflage soldiers up, you know, and they jumped back, and two of my guys came out of the rear of this canal. We had silenced weapons. They had them pointing at these kids who were froze stiff in the place, and they were asking me, what do we do? What do we do? And, of course, that was the first big decision that was put on me as a commander. You know, that was my decision to make. There was nobody else around. I had to make that decision. At that point, I had children about that age, and my response was, we did not come here to shoot the children of our enemy. So they lowered the weapons, the children ran off, and we thought, oh my goodness, you know, they're going to go tell people, we're going to be compromised. Um, so we get on the radios and we're calling for exfiltration. We explained what happened to the 18th Airborne Corps. We asked them to have close air support on standby. Well. Nothing happened. Those girls that went off, the little kids, if they told somebody, maybe they didn't believe them or maybe they were, they were scared. But nobody reacted to us because of those, those initial children. So what we decided, we got with the, the, my team sergeant, Sergeant First Class Charlie Hopkins. He was in the other hide site. We linked up in the canal, and we decided that our sites were compromised, but not necessarily the mission. So we was going to move out of those hide sites. We was going to move to another location, reestablish ourselves, and continue on with the mission. Then if somebody reacted to those hide sites, at that time they would be empty and no one would be around. Now, quick question. Did you ask for exfiltration and the 18th Airborne Corps told you no, continue mission, or you were no, still waiting no, to hear back not. from them? They, they were working on it. They said, we're working on okay. the exfiltration. We'll have close air support. And then we later, when nothing happened, we called and we canceled that. And we explained to them that we were going to continue on with our mission. We were going to move to another area. Just, just what I just told you, we told the 18th Airborne Corps. So we got out of the hide sites, and we knew we was going to be moving. So we left a lot of the uh, some of the heavier equipment behind as we moved moved out. And then... As we moved away up this canal, we was moving further back to the west along this canal. And this canal was anywhere from chest deep all the way down to maybe knee deep. So we're kneeling, we're rising, we're coming up the canal. And then we came up, when we got up to the canal, we got to an area, we said, okay, we'll just, we'll just hang out in this area here until it gets dark, and then we'll move and establish ourselves somewhere else. Because if we came up out of this, this canal or this ditch we would be exposed. And, and what happened was we got compromised a second time. This oh, wow. time by adult, adult male and two young boys who came right up to the hide site. Again, we had, we, had, we had weapons, but these were unarmed civilians. So I spoke to the individual, my best, the best Arabic that I had at the time, which was, was, was very rusty, you know, and tried to explain to him, you know, hey, you need to just go away and leave us alone. And 
he scurried off, but we knew this time that we were going to be in trouble because they took off at a dead beat back into across this highway to the village that was over there. So at that time, we again got on the radio. We called for exfiltration and for close air support to be on standby. 18th Airborne Corps said they'll, they'll get the close air support lined up and that they'll work on the exfiltration. So as they went off, we continued to move further back to the west up this ditch. And then what happened is that we, they did react to us that time. There came a lot of, a lot of people came out. They were, they were Bedouins. They were townspeople initially. They came out with basically hunting rifles. And so those were the initial people that was coming up onto us. And then as we, as we moved up, we de- we determined that we had been compromised, so we took off our rucksacks and we took off all the non-essential equipment that we were going to need. We wanted to go light because we knew we were going to have to go into a, an exfiltration or a, an escape and invasion uh, plan that we had thoroughly worked out prior to that. And so we took that equipment off. We put it in our rucksacks. We already had an explosive charge set up in this for the this event which was C4 explosives. We packed everything, including additional radios, additional equipment, batteries, uh, the, the heavier stuff. We, we packed it all in there, and we pulled. There was a one-minute time fuse on that explosive device. We pulled the time fuse and continued to move up the canal. When the, when the explosion went off, a minute later, there were screams because the Iraqis were already on top of that equipment. The last word we had was that close air support was 20 minutes out, and we had forces that was less than a minute behind us. And then, on top of that, then military forces start arriving up on this highway. They start pulling up. There was a bus that was full of troops. There was basically two and a half ton trucks the three of them that were full of troops. And there was like a command vehicle, an SUV type of vehicle that, that was getting out. And they began flagging down vehicles that was coming up and down the road, and they were enlisting people, you know, to help them, to get in the car. So people were coming out. Um, about that time, after after the, uh, the rucksacks exploded and the equipment exploded, we come under heavy small arms fire into that ditch. And so we moved further away. Finally, the, the ditch ended, and it made a sharp 90-degree turn back to the right or back to the south, and it just ended. So it was an L shape in the ditch. So I told, my, I told the guys, we have to set up our defensive positions here, and we have to prepare ourselves to fight because we're, we're in a lot of trouble. The close air support eventually showed up on, on, on the scene. Well, we had a... a I think it was called a PSC-3 radio. That radio had uh, the ability to talk SATCOM or satellite communications back to the 18th Airborne Corps. And then we could screw a small antenna into the, into the top of it, and it would go uh, uh, an ultra UHF frequency that would allow us to talk to the air crews on the F-16s that were coming in. Okay, that's, that's helpful. That radio <laughs> Yeah, it, so we had the radio set up to talk to the close air support because they were on their way in. We could hear them arrive. We could hear the roar of the F-16s coming overhead. We could hear the pilots talking to each other in the cockpit. But in the in the process of moving, blowing up things, we had lost a critical component of that radio, which was an adapter that allowed us to screw in the antenna so we could talk to them. So we could hear them, and we was unable to speak to them. I mean, it was just, you know, we knew that we was in a lot of trouble at that time, and we was under small arms fire. Now, so you were worried stuff. because you were worried about the close air support actually hitting you, not the enemy. That, that, that's one of the, the okay. problems. But the other problem is in order to direct close air support, you have to identify to the aircraft where your position is at. Right. Once they know where you're at, then all of your... All your close air support is directed from your position. You would call out a distance and an azimuth oh, gotcha. direction okay. yeah. from your position to where the enemy forces were. Okay. So it was a dire situation. We was under enemy fire. We was returning fire. We was holding off the advancing Bedouins. The, the forces were still aligning up on that highway. When finally it was one of the one of my soldiers, I think it was our Como guy, 
uh, Jimmy Weatherford, he pulled out a PRC-90. Basically, it's a survival radio, Vietnam era, that Air Force pilots would carry so that they would have communications if they got shot down. It was a survival radio. And he said, will this work? And it worked on one frequency. It's called the guard frequency. It's an emergency frequency. So we took that radio, and my weapon sergeant, Sergeant Buzz Saw de Groff, he began calling out, anybody on this net? And our call sign was guard. Say, this is guard. Anybody on that, this is guard. And what happened is that it reached an AWACS aircraft that was flying, basically directing aircraft into the battle that was now going on heavily. Uh, so the AWACS aircraft identified, hey, this is, you know, we got a special forces team. We explained the situation to them. So they radioed to the, air, the aircraft, the F-16s, and told them to go to the guard net. So our call sign was guard, and we was on the guard net. So they referred to us as guard on guard. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we was able to talk to the air crews. And, and as we're trying to identify where we're at, we had a hard time doing that, but they could see that highway and the, and the vehicles that was lined up along it. So we, our first airstrike that we called was on this mass of vehicles and troops that were lined up on the highway preparing to come out, you know, and, and confront us. So the, the aircraft comes down, and it was, it was just an amazing thing to witness. You could look out, you could see this line of vehicles, 15 to 20 vehicles, I'd say, that was on the highway, a mass of soldiers, people getting ready to prepare, and this airstrike comes in, and it was cluster bombs, CBU-82 cluster bombs that comes out in a bomb. The shell of the bomb opens up, and it drops thousands of smaller bomblets that come out. They're designed to kill tanks, and they're designed for personnel. When those bombs strafed that convoy, which they did, it, in one second they was there, and the next second it's just a, a flame of twisted metal. It, it was burning. They completely destroyed with their first airstrike one of the greatest threats to us, which was, was on that highway. And when that bomb went off, the civilians that was coming out there, the Bedouins, they kind of left the battlefield. Because I explained it before, it seemed like it was kind of like a scene out of the Civil War where people used to come out and set up chairs to watch the battle. And that's what was going on. People was coming out. They was curious. I think they thought that we were a downed air crew. And Saddam had offered big money, you know, bonuses for anybody that would capture American air crews. But when they started to maneuver on us, they were surprised when we was able to return fire. One of the best weapons that we had was the 40 millimeter grenade launcher that was connected to the bottom of the of the M16 rifle. M203 guys, we had we had two of them, but we had limited rounds. So as the as they're maneuvering on us, they're not. These are not hardened troops. That I I assessed that they were probably a reserve unit or a communications unit because there was a tower a few miles back to the south of us that contained, you know, there was a, a small military encampment there. So we, we kind of thought that that's where these people had come from. And as they're moving on us, they're standing upright. They got their weapons in their hands. They're taking shots at us once in a while, but they're, they're clumped together. There'll be four or five of them walking together, you know, not moved, not dispersed tactically. When, when the M203 gunner, Staff Sergeant DeGroff, I told him, I said, you need to open up with that M203 and stop this assault, these clusters of people. And so he, br he brings out, he, he gets his 203 ready, and then he turns to me, he says, well, is that about 400, uh, 400 meters where they're at? And my response was, don't ask me, you're the weapons man. Just do it. <laughs> He took aim, he, he took a slight adjustment. His first round landed off to the right. And he later told me he failed to confiscate because the round of the, of the M203, the 40 millimeter grenade launcher, it rotates as it comes out on a rifle, uh, of a rifle barrel, it rotates to the right and it'll, it'll cause that round to bear to the right. And he told me he failed to account for that, that right hand spin that goes into the round. His second, his second shot was right on target. As a matter of fact, it hit one of them people that was coming in. It, it hit him in the head or the shoulder, 
I mean, it, it, it just went off in, in, you know, one minute there, there was five to six uh, people moving toward this. And then there, you know, then you could, they're down and there's one guy, you know, his clothes are tattered and he's stumbling and he goes down. Uh, our, the, the, uh, the other guys were opening up with their M16 rifles. I told them to conserve ammo. We did not have a lot of ammo. We was on a mission that was not supposed to be a combat mission. We were not, you know, expecting to get into a gunfight, but we were prepared if we did. But we had to conserve ammo because there was a lot of people come to get us and we had limited ammo. Is there any point in time? uh, I'm sorry there. Is there any point in time where you felt like you weren't going to make it out alive? Yes. Yes. That that point in time, (laughs) it, it had come and it was there. As a matter of fact, two of my guys, Sergeant DeGroff and Sergeant Kostrevsky, they were on opposite sides of this ditch, and I caught them one moment of them. They turned around, they looked at each other, and they actually waved goodbye to each other. Uh, you know, it was that dire. Wow. Finally, when we, finally, as we went through the process of trying to get the aircraft to identify where we were at, one of the things we didn't have with us was smoke because, we, as you know, we was weighed down heavily, and there were some things that we just, you know, we did not bring with us and a, a 40, 40 millimeter grenade launcher has a smoke round that goes into it that you can mark your area they also have handheld smoke grenades that you could throw out but we didn't have any of those we had pin flares we had a vs-17 panel which is a bright orange reflective panel that you can lay out and we had signaling mirrors so we're trying to do the best we can to signal where it there's conversation going on with the air crew and finally, it was one of them said, I, I believe I just seen the flash. And he identified, and he was the youngest. It was a lieutenant that was flying, and there was a, a full bird colonel, Billy Deal, from out of, out of Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina, was flying the lead aircraft. It was a four-ship sortie of F-16s. And he he uh, directed him. He said, look. I want you to go ahead and then and, and drop your bombs. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to drop a bomb that was away from us where we could give where that bomb hit and then we could guide them closer to our location. And that's what they did. And then so we gave them the distance we were from it. We began, we were still flashing them. Of course, we're under heavy fire that all the time this is going on. And we're on a, an old Vietnam-era PRC-90 radio calling in close air support we finally got them to locate us, and we, then we was in business. We was able to clo- call in close air support on the mass of troops that had now recalculated, you know, regathered, and was moving towards us. So we brought in cluster bombs on top of them personnel. It was danger close. Some of them, some of them bombs, there were CBU 82s, and there were 2,000 pound bombs that they carried, and there were 16 sorties. That means there were 16 four ship. F-16 sorties that flew close air support for us that day because as they would come in, they would drop their munitions, and then they'd run low on fuel, and they would fly away, and they would have another sortie lined up to come in. Gotcha. During that delay, the, the, the Iraqis knew they could hear the aircraft flying off, you know, and so they would they would pick up the attack on us. They would start to come in, and we would hold them off with – with, uh, with a small arms fire or M203s, what was of major concern to me was the ditch that we just came up because it wasn't like a street ditch. It, it, it would twist and it would turn as it came up. And I was fearful that we would have some, some people wanting to come up that ditch because if they, they could come up and overrun our position very easily if they did that. So as we're calling in the close air support, myself and Sergeant First Class Robbie Gardner, he was my communication sergeant. We went, we did a counter char attack back down that ditch. So we went back down the ditch to clear that ditch of any enemy forces. As we went down, that's exactly what happened. We had came face to face with a point element that was moving up the ditch. We caught them by surprise. We was able to shoot them and eliminate the point element. We moved all the way back down the ditch to where we had blown up our gear because we wanted to make sure that everything got destroyed. And at that time, we knew that we've gone, you know, that it was going to, nightfall was coming, it was going to get colder. So we grabbed some of the, the Gore Tex coats and things that had been 
blown up, although they had, you know, you know, they had shrapnel rounds stuck in them. They would provide some warmth. So we, we gathered that stuff up, <laughs> moved back up, and of course the team had heard the gunfire from the point element. So they were freaking out. They didn't know what was going on. So by the time we got back, you know, we was all together again. We had close air support flying for us. And for the remainder of the day, that was that was what went on. We was calling in close air support. We later found out that when the uh, the air crew from Shaw Air Force Base was inbound, there was a, basically a column of armor that was coming up the road. We can only assume that they were reacting to us being there. And so they took out that armor column because they came in with APCs, tanks, heavy machine guns or mortars, we would have been in a lot of trouble. But as long as it, as long as it was confined to the small arms fire and we had the F-16s flying above, and when they showed up and they started dropping bombs, I, I told people it was like your big brother showing up in a street fight. Yeah. I, I can't say enough for the U.S. Air Force. They came in there. They was concerned about us. They wanted to help us. Later we found out when the call went out that there was a special forces team that was, you know, basically pinned down and under attack. They said that they could not handle all the, the request from the Air Force that was out there flying saying, hey, hey, we're ready. We're just top off on floor. They wanted to come in because they knew that their brothers on the ground were in trouble. I later got to meet those Air Force pilots. Oh, that's awesome. But back to the story, we, we continued on, and then as nightfall came in, we had basically broke the back and the will of the Iraqi forces to pursue the fight. Although there were there was there were there were sp- sporadic gunfire, we basically had it under control. The the next thing was that we wanted to get our emergency exfiltration. We wanted to get the helicopters in there. Well, we later found out that they would not deploy the helicopters during the daylight hours because it was too risky. There was a lot of triple A or air defense artillery units in the area. They were concerned about losing you losing one of the you know the helicopter pilots coming in. One of the lessons we learned, and this is from the Vietnam veterans that I'd worked with in my career, was that when the helicopters would come in in Vietnam, a lot of times the enemy would allow them to come in and land, and then they would step up the attack and try to you know to attack the helicopter crews. So as nightfall, we looked around, and I, I seen further back to the west. It, it looked like a larger berm. So we conducted what we call a retrograde operation. We moved out of that area, and we, we moved across the desert floor, and we got behind that berm where when the helicopters came in, there would be some cover between where they landed and where the Iraqi forces were at. We were still in contact with the F-16s. They were above us flying that close air support waiting, you know, for us to, to bring in any, any fire that they needed. When they notified us that the Black Hawk helicopters, our, 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 basically our exfiltration aircraft, was inbound. And so they were trying to contact us. Well, all we had was that survival radio, and then pilots were flying low, but so we could not directly talk to the air crews uh, the, uh, of the Black Hawk helicopters. They were basically relaying through the F-16s to us what they needed, and they wanted to know what our exact location was. Well, what had happened, I told, I told the weapons guy, well, bring out that GPS, let's see where we're at. When he brought the GPS out, because we was moving, we was under attack, we, you know, we, was, we was down our belly, we was up, it had destroyed the GPS system. He shook it oh, and man. rattled like there was a bunch of bolts <laughs> in it and stuff. So it was out, so we could not we could not give them our exact location. When it finally came to us, we're on a, a PRC-90 survival radio, and it has a beacon mode that sends out a, a marker signal. We asked, can you pick up this beacon mode on our PRC-90? They said, well, turn it on. So we turned on the beacon, and within a few minutes, two Black Hawk helicopters swooped down out of the night sky landed next to us, we rolled out of that area onto the, the Black Hawk helicopters, lifted off, and flew out of, uh, out of Iraq back to the safety of Saudi Arabia. There was, no, there was no casualties from our men taken that day, although there was a lot of rounds that came in very close. We, you know, we, had a, we had, all of us had assumed, 
you know, that we were not going to make it out of there. Right. One thing that was, I'm sure that was in abundance of that day, there was a lot of prayers coming out of that ditch. You know, How long did the whole ordeal take? We was, it, the whole ordeal, we got in there at nightfall. It was basically a 24 hour period from the time oh. we got on the, on, you know, on the ground, probably, probably a little less, probably 18, 19 hours from the time we got on the ground. Chad, that's still a long ass time, man. <laughs> that's unreal. It, it, is, it is a long time, and it's a long time when you're 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 under attack. And you yeah, got rounds coming in, you got rounds going out, and it all didn't happen all that all that quick. But what I want to say about my team is that they were a team of professionals. These guys were highly skilled, highly trained, and when they were unable to deploy in the rear, they actually taught. They rotated the teams from the group through, and they taught close air support procedures to the teams of the fifth special forces group. So what a skill that would come in handy later on. So they were all trained up on, you know, on the procedures for close air support. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you this, that nothing happened on the ground that day that we did not talk about, that we did not prepare for. Uh, of course it didn't unfold the way we, uh, you know, we had discussed. If we came up on civilians, the thing was, well, we would bring them down into the ditch you know, we would tie them up and we'd leave them there. The medic was prepared to basically give them a shot, you know, a sedative to put them out for a while. But it never got to that. You know, first of all, I I did not. The last thing as a commander I wanted was to get in a gunfight. I had eight people on the ground and I wanted to preserve my force. And above all, I wanted to I wanted to continue with the mission. As a soldier, the most important thing to you is your mission. That's what you have to accomplish above all else. Mm -hmm. As we lifted out of the out, out of Iraq after this whole ordeal, I told I told my weapon sergeant, I said, I don't know if we're going to be court martialed, you know, or, <laughs> or if we're going to be praised because we did not accomplish our assigned mission, and, and that really bothered us. That we, you know, that. One, that we, we got into an area that we the intel was incorrect on, although we had prepared the best we could with the information we had, you know, that didn't work out. It, uh, the hindsight, the hindsight we put in was kind of shoddy, and our intent was at nightfall, we would work and we would, you know, we would improve our hindsight conditions, but we never made it to the first nightfall before we got compromised. And, and, and much of that was due because we... We did not expect to have hardened soil. We did not. There was a lot of things that came mm -hmm. unexpectedly, but things that we had talked about. So, Chad, ultimately, you guys were all rewarded and awarded for your efforts as you brought everybody home safe. I have to yeah. ask you, though, and I mentioned this at the top of the show, how this was, you know, a similar story to Lone Survivor. When you saw that whole thing take place where civilians and stumbled upon their position and you heard about that story. Did it sort of almost send chills up your spine a little bit about how similar it was to what you guys went through? Well, yeah, it was, but that story of Lone Survivor was, was later on. I believe that was, yes. That. I mean, it was much, much later on, but you, you had sort of yeah. lived it first in a much less publicized yeah. manner. Yes, that, that's true, and it was very it was very similar to that, you know. Except we did not lose all of our force, except, right? Sure, except yeah. For one guy, and in that account, we were very fortunate. It was, you know, the, the, like I say, there was a lot of prayers. A lot of us, you know, at, at, say there was divine intervention that day, you know, out there on the battlefield. Uh, you know, there, there was there was a lot of people. There, were, there there was men of faith on my team. There was, you know, these these were men that had come from, you know, from towns across America, you know, they were from, they were from Virginia, they were from New York, they, you know, they were from various areas, they had families, uh, they were, at that point, they were career soldiers, they were on a second or third enlistment, uh, they were E6s and E7s, uh, I, at that time, I was a, a senior a CW2, um, so, the, and, and generally on an 18, the average rank on your A team is a sergeant first class and E seven. You have a, a master sergeant as a team sergeant. As a company first sergeant, we don't have first sergeants, we have a company sergeant major. The companies are commanded by majors, not captains, because A teams are commanded by captains. So it, it is a rank heavy but a very experienced force, a special forces A team. It, it is as I look back, it was it was one of the, it was the best time of my life. 
was being on a special forces A team. I have never found that camaraderie. I've never found that closeness. Uh, and I explain it to people and the uninitiated can never understand that bonding that went on. Sure. Yeah. So these, these are men that truly loved each other, was concerned about each other, was concerned about their families and their children, knew, knew their history. You know, you have to be close if you've got four men that's going to live in an eight foot by eight foot, you know, a hole dug in the dirt. For We was planning on being there for a week. Uh, and then the, the plan was after, after that time was up, U.S. forces would come through and we would link up with friendly forces and be brought out of the area by the friendly forces that was going to sweep through the area. Of course, we never got to that at that point. And, and we never expected that, you know, that the, the war was going to be over in 100 hours. Um, you know, there was, there was some major wars that went on and battles that went on in Desert Storm, major tank battles that went on in Desert Storm that a lot of people aren't aware of. And we did not win all of them. We had the Iraqi, Iraqi armor had at one time, you know, put one of our, our armored uh, – our armored battalions had, had defeated them in battle, uh, you know, on the way into uh, going, going into Iraq, actually going in, into uh, in, in, into Kuwait to clear that out of there. The, the aftermath, after after we deployed back and, and things had settled down, uh, you know, there everybody knows about the highway of death. You know, we know that we routed the Iraqi forces. We had there was the equivalent of I think it was six army divisions of coalition forces. These were, these were Arab forces, Arab battalions, including a battalion from Syria that was in support of Operation Desert Storm. Each one of those coalition battalions had special forces A teams assigned to them, what we call coalition warfare. General Schwarzkopf called special forces the glue that held the coalition together. And I believe that's a real good assessment because they were on the spot. They were responsible for training, you know, bringing them together, fighting with them coalition forces. And he also described special forces as the eyes and the ears of the coalition. And and that's exactly what we were out there to do. Uh, we got compromised. There were several other teams that got sent out, basically similar missions, that also got compromised. I think every team that went in on the ground – the intel was old. They didn't have up updated data. Had got compromised. It had to be brought out, you know, uh, basically under fire. So we were we weren't the only team that was in that situation. There. Sure. And then and then we also had you know we had forces out doing scud hunting. Those were basically our counterterrorism forces that was put into, into action and out actively looking for scud missile launchers because they were, as you know, Saddam was attempting to fire scuds into Israel, hoping Israel would retaliate and break up the coalition, the Arab coalition that was put together to fight them. So there was a lot, there was a lot of politics and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, a whole lot of effort that was put together by General Schwarzkopf and his staff, by the, the Special Operations Command Central. Basically, that's the U.S. Central Command's Special Operations component. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a huge Herculean effort that went on in Operation Desert Storm. And it was it was something that the U.S. military needed. It was something that the country needed, especially after what happened during the Vietnam War, when basically, you know, U.S. forces were were run out, it, not because of militarily, but it was political decisions. And and those those forces that came home from Vietnam, they you know they never got that that welcoming home ceremony. They they were not. Uh, greeted with open arms like we were coming back. No, that's it, true. It was, it, it was important to me personally to to see that when we, you know, to come back. And one of the reasons is that when I came into Special Forces, basically in early in 1980, the 5th Special Forces Group had spent 10 years in Vietnam from 1961 to 1971. So our senior NCOs, the senior members of our detachments, our team sergeants, our sergeants majors, they were all Vietnam veterans. In addition to being Vietnam veterans amongst our forces, we had Sante Raiders. And though that was the group that was put together in Vietnam to go in and liberate the Sante prison camp in North Vietnam. 
as we know now, that mission failed. Or it, it really didn't fail. What happened is the prisoners had been had been removed earlier because of flooding, so they weren't able to do that. But they had set the way in training on mission preparedness. The Sante Raiders were sprinkled amongst our ranks. And another thing that a lot of the public doesn't know about, within the 5th Special Forces Group from 1977 to 1979, was what we called Project Blue Light. And Project Blue Light was our nation's first counterterrorism force, and they were established solely within the 5th Special Forces Group to fill in that void as the Delta Force was standing up to take on that role. Uh, Colonel Charlie Beckworth, who started the Delta Force, told the Department of Defense that he would need two years. And they said, well, that's that's long. So in the interim, the 5th Special Forces Group stood up Project Blue Light, which was a counterterrorism force. So, uh, And that goes back to the people that was in the 5th Special Forces Group in my early years. They were also members of Project Blue Light, highly skilled counterterrorism forces. So the training that I received as a young Special Forces soldier came from Vietnam veterans. It came from Sante Raiders, and it came from Project Blue Light soldiers. That's incredible. Highly experienced. I just can't say enough about the 5th Special Forces Group. In my opinion, the premier Special Forces Group in the Armed Forces because of its history and its lineage. Well, Chad, it is an amazing, amazing story. Uh, I'm so thankful that you shared it with us because it's one I've never heard before, and I'm sure I guarantee a lot of our audience hasn't heard it before. I mean, the Gulf War, in the grand scheme of things, went by in the blink of an eye, and not much experience was drawn from it. It's certainly not like it was in Vietnam, nor has it been the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan, for that matter. But certainly, I mean, just thank you for so much detail and so much life into this story. It certainly made it worthwhile listening to. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thank you for your opportunity to tell this story, because I believe the American public, they need to hear these type of stories and know that their professional military is out there on a day-to-day basis working for the good of the country, for our national security. Tad Bollins, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thank you very much for having me. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show... Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.